thank you all for joining us, and thank you to everyone joining us online. Um, I'd like to encourage you to tweet uh, if you'd like. The hashtag is WEF, uh, hashtag WEF20. Um, so as you all know and are aware, uh, ecology is a primary track at this uh, meeting, and um, all five of the risks outlined in the WEF, or all top, the top five uh, risks outlined in the WEF risk report uh, are related to ecology, the environment in some way. One of them is biodiversity, um, and one report, one stat from the report that WEF put out uh, last week is that $44 trillion is either moderately linked or highly linked to biodiversity. It's more than half of global GDP. So we're gonna talk in this session about why that's important for business, uh, and we have a very distinguished panel here, um, starting, um, I guess, closest to me. Kristen Reckberger is the CEO of Dynamic Planet, which is a firm that advances markets, uh, markets that restore nature. Um, Sven Torre Hosseder, did, did I say that right? Um, CEO, President and CEO of Yara Group, which is a chemical company that makes chemicals for agriculture. Uh, Sherry uh, Nur Salim is the vice chairman of the Gitti Group, which is a, a large manufacturer a conglomerate. Um, and Marco uh, Bazzari, who is the CEO uh, and president of the Gucci of Gucci. Um, we have a video to set the scene. The video is uh, part from the award, Emmy award-winning uh, Netflix series Our Planet which has been viewed by over 100 million people uh, and helped really galvanize action on some of the issues that we're discussing. So we'll start the video and then we'll get into uh, some discussion. The age of humans. We are now the dominant force of change on the planet. Nature once determined how we survive. Now we determine how nature survives. Three quarters of the land surface and two thirds of the ocean are impacted by our activities. In the summer, there is 40% less Arctic sea ice cover than there was in 1980. Almost half of our planet's forests have been felled for their timber and to make space for ourselves and our livestock. And at sea, our extensive overfishing is leading to the collapse of key fish stocks. The cod stocks crashed back home in Newfoundland, where I was from, and you know, thousands of people thrown out of work, boats beached, canneries emptied. And that was the real wake-up call. That's where I began to understand that there will be no jobs on a dead planet. The destruction of our natural world is already costing us trillions of dollars every year. Suddenly, the costs of the age of humans are outweighing the benefits. We are at risk of entering a danger zone where we could trigger irreversible and self-amplifying change which could push the whole planet ultimately away from the, the, the desired equilibrium. We are at risk of destabilizing the whole planet. We have just 10 years to drastically alter our path before it will be too late to avoid catastrophic changes to our planet. We need revolutionary speed, right? We need a, a green revolution and it needs to happen at the scale and at the speed of the digital and internet and mobile revolution. And what drove the speed and scale of these revolutions? Business. The same force that powered the last period of global change can also power the next. The business sector has no option but to be a force for change. Successful businesses will embrace the clean technologies that now exist are we going to run out of wind and sunshine in Texas before we run out of fossil fuels? I'm betting on wind and solar. First and foremost, I'm a businessman, and the, the original decision was just, a, it was a business decision. New ideas and land management strategies will help us protect our biodiversity and feed more people with less land. 
The health of the ocean is critical to the way our planet operates. Future businesses will respect it as a resource that belongs to all of us, only taking what it can naturally replace. Next generation businesses will design their product lines to fit within circular economies. Waste from one process becomes food for the next. Waste is just a resource in the wrong place. That's even true for carbon dioxide. It's true for plastics. It's true for everything that we think we're throwing away. There is no way. And so we need to create economies that actually have infrastructure that enable that circular design. If you ask millennials, what is the purpose of business? 47% said some version of the purpose of business is to improve society and protect the environment. This is a fundamental sea change in the way an entire generation thinks about business. It's gonna mean that if you want to attract the top talent and retain them, if you wanna win over millennial customers and attract the $30 trillion of capital that's currently being given to millennials by the baby boomer generation, you're gonna to have to have a narrative around how your products are sustainable and, and healthy. Sustainability is now the only business plan. I think that in the future when we look back, there will be two types of companies. Companies that got it and companies that didn't get it. I know which segment I'd like to belong to. The only viable future is one in which business innovates to demand less of our world. In that future, the wild will recover. We can restore the balance of nature, fix the relationship between our planet and our business, and change the way we live on our planet for the better, forever. Great. Well, that's a great introduction to, I think, what we're going to have a great, uh, to our great conversation today. Um, one quick note, I'm going to talk, or in, I'm going to ask questions for about 15 minutes and then encourage questions from the audience. So please uh, be thinking about questions as we go along so I don't have to talk for half an hour. Um, I'm going to start with Kristen uh, to give sort of an overview of the problem that we face and what it means for business when it comes to uh, nature and biodiversity. So we'll start with you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, there are three things we need to do to fix and get our planet back in balance. I think we've all heard a lot about it, especially in the last couple of years. Switch to renewable energy as fast as possible. Produce food more effectively, given especially the 30 to 40 percent that we're wasting. And this last piece is expanding nature. And it doesn't get as much attention as the other two. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So why should we expand nature? And, and as our species likes to say, what's, what's in it for us? <laughs> um, the extinction rate is a thousand times higher um, than when humans joined the world. And our best thinking estimates, Justin mentioned the figure 40 trillion, there's latest science and economics coming out throughout this year to really try to hone in that number. What we think is actually about $125 trillion it, that the global ecosystem services are not accounted for in our markets, but that we receive for free. So business is highly subsidized. We're getting tons of stuff for free. And so just as quick examples, um, did you know if we weighed all the terrestrial mammals on the planet right now, 4% are wild. The rest are livestock and human. So we have domesticated our world in a huge way. We have, we have unwilded our world. And what that means is that all the other creatures that are providing the services for us for free, the, the breathing that we do, the food that we eat, fresh water, they're getting, it's getting harder and harder for them to do their jobs with us and for us. So that all leads to our business resources. It's going to continue to upset supply chains along with climate change pressures. So. Um, Businesses are heavily dependent on nature, and um, the overuse of the natural world is costing us about $2 trillion per year. It could go up to about $28 trillion per year if these trends continue. So uh, many of us are arguing that the most cost-effective thing to do is to have more nature. And some people would say, with 10 billion people, how can you have more nature? We need to feed more people. Well, there's plenty of food. We can do it more efficiently, and we can make more room for nature. So um, we're really excited about... Um, moving a group of governments towards, um, in China this year is a very important meeting in Kunming in October called the Convention for Biodiversity, which is like the Paris Agreement for Nature. 
and many groups are saying we need 30% of the planet protected by 2030 because scientists are telling us we need the world in natural state to provide for this. So it's a very, very cost-effective cost way for us to move forward. So I want to go to a couple of the panelists to talk specifically, uh, give us some specific examples of how nature, the threat, the risks to biodiversity are a threat to their supply chain and to their business. So I'll start with Marco if you'd like to talk about this question, particularly you know, a, a fashion house that uh, uh, you know, relies on many different natural products. Uh, um, you know, fashion, we are interacting with so many uh, different industries, agriculture, mining, forestry. So supply and chain are so uh, interacting one to the other, and it's such a complex topic. And especially in fashion, we tended, especially in the past, but it's still true today, to hide a little bit what is happening um, for many reasons, because we want to keep secrets and to maintain competitive advantage in many instances, in many functions. But we cannot do that anymore in the supply chain. And the supply chain, uh, for me, you know, the way in which we could um, potentially uh, uh, try to solve the problem is to give the total transparency of what we do and where we get uh, pollution from. Uh, for this reason, we decided to monitor what we do on every level of the supply chain, and that is uh, open, open source in our uh, website, so everybody can uh, double check where we are doing well, where we're not doing well, what we need to improve, etc. Uh, but the real question is that in the video, everybody's saying embracing technology, we are doing that, but technology is not there yet. And even if we set targets for 2050, 2025, as we do, it's like I, if, if I decide to, with my boss to set a target for my budget in 2050. 2050, I will be 87. I would love to manage Gucci when I, was, when I will be 87. It's not realistic. So what we are doing today, so for this reason, we decided to go entirely carbon neutral in 2018, so meaning offsetting everything that is not possible to reduce, avoid through technology. But to do so is not a way just to pay for our pollution. The way in which we do it, we decide to go in buying some um, uh, red plus. That red plus is not just planting trees, it's also is especially to protect biodiversity and saying enlarge nature is the point. So trying to create a kind of a social offset, making sure that the communities that we are helping have a reason to protect forests, because at the event of deforestation is an economical problem. So if we are able to create the communities and a fostering education and else in these communities, they're going to be able to protect the forest, etc. I just I want to press just very, very briefly, just if there are maybe one or two examples to give people some uh, sense of um, the sort of things that, that you see right now where you see a, you know, the, the loss of biodiversity as a threat specifically in your supply chain, if, if there are things that come to mind. Yes, in the sense that I mean, everything that we get for our products is coming from the soil. And the soil is completely polluted. I mean, we have an expert here that's going to tell us uh, uh, what they can do. But the point is that if, as long as we keep on using um, uh, chemicals, uh, we, we, we are not going to the regenerative agriculture, we're going to finish to have the right product. Everything is going to be polluted. Everything starts from the soil, because from there, we have everything else in the supply chain. So if you are not able to interact immediately on that, everything that you do is, is useless. Right. So that's the reason why we have an impact on everything that we create, or we use, biscuits, cut on everything. So everything starts from the soil, because the soil is going to suck everything that is out, upstairs. And let me just um, finish, because uh, we decided to go carbon neutral, but the point is, um, if I do it by myself, even if it's a big company, Gucci, we have a tiny impact on the world. So we decided to launch a, a challenge to all the CEOs across industries, uh, in order to make sure, and putting my face on it, and uh, trying to see if someone is going to follow me, so you know, like the flag and everybody, there's nobody else. Uh, we have two companies uh, that joined us um, uh, until now, the Real Real and Lavazza, Italian company, the coffee company. We have other companies um, trying to join in, in, the, in the coming future. But it's not easy, because when we talk, when I talk about the challenge, everybody's willing to join. But when they see the route that they need to, to go through, transparency, scope one, scope two, scope three, especially supply chain, that is 90% of the impact on the pollution, the people that try to hide away. So it's, it's not just something for fun. I, I, I did the challenge, I mean, remembering the ice bucket, 
challenge, but it's not as fun as the ice bucket challenge. But this is the idea behind. Right. Great. Well, uh, Sherry, I want to go to you next. I mean, you have a diverse business with lots of different uh, uh, things that you do. Um, so could you t talk a bit about the supply chain risks for, yeah. for your business? Yeah. Uh, just to lead from, I think, what was shared on the soil, uh, I would just share that I think our business is diversified, but we are uh, the largest uh, auto tire manufacturer in China. And uh, I think we just opened a plant in South Carolina and we're also uh, the largest in Southeast Asia. Uh, we, of course, also the rubber comes from the soil. Um, and so I think the raw materials, uh, there's also that, that uh, linkage. We're also uh, in real estate. And I think um, I shared about uh, with you um, a project that we are working on that I'm very passionate about is uh, island development in Bali. And we would like to do sort of an eco island development. And there's many cases and examples of how we have actually um, sort of supported uh, in terms of the uh, biodiversity, um, uh, how do we regenerate the soil and a lot of the other efforts that we have done uh, for that project, including uh, with uh, sort of innovative solutions. and. Uh, we are also in uh, retail, uh, in, uh, we represent many brands, uh, including uh, working, for example, with Starbucks. Uh, we represent Starbucks uh, in Indonesia, uh, and uh, we also, uh, uh, and some other Zara and other brands. <laughs> but uh, we, we also, uh, uh, I think one thing I want to highlight, uh, I'm a member of the family business community in uh, WAF. And I do feel, and we have Kim Samuel, uh, who is uh, my, <laughs> my sister from Canada. <laughs> so anyway, we, we work uh, on the family business. And I think there is something about family businesses also that uh, I think from very early on, I think 20 years ago, we already covered our carbon footprint by over 100 years working with uh, Conservation International. And we have been very involved with um, supporting uh, 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 forest, uh, supporting the forest, but also oceans. Uh, I think we have done the blue auction, uh, the first ever auction to support uh, uh, new species that are dif discovered. And uh, we, were, we are the first to do the tagging of uh, uh, the largest fish, uh, the whale sharks, and, and other um, uh, efforts that uh, I think uh, we are very worried about what is going on. And last night, I think we just hosted a Tri Takarana forum on blended finance, uh, on sort of supporting natural capital as well as uh, climate uh, resilient solutions. And so uh, we, we, are, we, we launched some sort of private uh, yeah. uh, sort of collaboration in oceans. And I think we helped with uh, National Geographic also to push for the uh, um, uh, high, high ambition uh, support for 30%. Yeah, thank you. It's a perfect segue to talk about solutions, which um, I think is uh, you know, more, more, one of the more interesting things uh, about this panel. Uh, I want to start with Finn. Uh, you, uh, when we spoke about uh, your business and how you've reoriented in some ways after the Paris Agreement. Um, just talk, could you talk a bit about opportunities that this challenge has given uh, your business? Sure, and uh, as we heard from the uh, the film uh, as well, there will be no jobs on a dead planet. And as, as you said, uh, Justin, in the introduction, uh, more than half of the GDP is either uh, directly or, or, or moderately impacted by, by nature. So it's in our very interest to look after nature. But uh, still, uh, what we see in many sectors is that the, the costs uh, outweigh the benefits uh, also for the food sector where, uh, where we are operating. Uh, the total value uh, of the food industry uh, is $10 trillion annually. Um, but the hidden costs uh, like health, environment, and uh, socioeconomic costs uh, are like $12 trillion. It's a negative $2 trillion. Um, so, so we need to find solutions to this and find business opportunities in, the, uh, in, in these costs uh, that uh, uh, that uh, impact us, uh, and um, that's what we did as a company as well. We, we, we were uh, in Paris uh, 
during the, the negotiations for the, for the agreement. And I was quite surprised to see that uh, the food and, uh, and ag industry was not really on the agenda, uh, but that has changed uh, dramatically, especially in the last, uh, last year, where we can be seen not as part of the problem, but more part of, part of the solution. And, and uh, to me, um, soil is, uh, is an important part of this. Um, Today, uh, agriculture represents 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. Half of that is changed with land use. Uh, really, taking down forests to clear land for, for more agriculture, which is absolutely not necessary. We're mining the soil of its nutrients and clearing new land because land has, uh, has not been given the appropriate uh, value. So let's change that around and see what can we do from agriculture to come up with solutions to this. And uh, for us as a crop nutrition company, we're looking at how can we help to, to solve that challenge and uh, make agriculture more productive where it's being operated. And uh, the good news here is that if we get farming right, it's possible to free up 1.2 billion hectares of land and turn it back into nature. And uh, with the carbon sequestration that can be done as part of that, uh, agriculture uh, can not only help to reduce emissions, it can actually absorb emissions. And within that is a tremendous business opportunity as well. Right. Um, Sherry, I want to I go to you. The COP, uh, the biodiversity COP in uh, China has come up, I think, at least once in this, in this conversation already. And I know that you work closely with uh, some of the, the folks who are leading that. Could you give us um, a sense of what to expect for that? Um, the WEF report identified it as a possible Paris moment for biodiversity. Is that something you see as possible? Yeah, I, I, I want to also congratulate WEF for the efforts, you know, aligning uh, many parties. Last night, our foundation just signed a collaboration with WEF also um, in sort of uh, uh, multi-stakeholders uh, uh, capitalism towards uh, these uh, efforts. And uh, I'm on the advisory board on the Bell and Road, and I'm also um, involved with the, um, uh, because the, the chair of the council for the COP15, uh, the Biodiversity COP in Kunming uh, for the edu uh, Environment Ministry is the GIDO, uh, the UN SDSN uh, Executive uh, Director, and we are the sort of the UN SDSN um, Southeast Asia, I'm the chair of it, and we are helping um, to uh, sort of encourage more countries to actually align with this. Uh, we, uh, we do see, this is something of a surprise, to be very frank. Um, and um, you know, we have uh, worked in China, and we have um, you know, seen sort of how China have shifted you know, when they started to realize um, the uh, damage to the people and, and I think there's one big shift that uh, I think was documented that uh, in the 98 when the Yangtze River um, flooding 3,000 people died and uh, 20 billion dollar of uh, damages and so the government policy makers had a shift of how instead of building higher dams and more like this they, they actually invited some of the environmental uh, scientists and communities to co to co sort of a co-create what should be the more uh, sort of eco civilization sort of solution that human and ecology and um, could find balance and I think that was the beginning of the ecological uh, red line um, and uh, I think uh, they have created a mapping system. Uh, that has very good measurements, which is what is really necessary for countries as they move towards this. So from the, I think you mentioned about the food area, the food production, the water retention, the soil retention, the sandstorm, the des desertification, carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, and biodiversity. So there is a sort of clear system and uh, have, they have really done very difficult choices. They're protecting like a quarter to 30% of the land. And that is, um, I think, uh, uh, Canada, France, um, uh, 
Italy, uh, Turkey, you know, Spain, all, all added together, it's more than that yeah. side. And, and so I think they, they, they have actually studied it intensively and they have moved, even sort of closed down a lot of the, some of the uh, uh, settlements uh, or sort of businesses near the wetlands or areas that are supposed to be part of the ecological red line protection. And so they took very tough decisions right. in order to prioritize um, this. And, and I think you know, this is something we would uh, encourage and... Um, yeah, great. Um, I, I want to go to Marco. Just to, you, you mentioned the CO uh, carbon neutral challenge. How do you make the case that to other businesses that this is something that they should be uh, concerned about? Um, you know, just maybe you'll give a little more detail about that. I mean, everybody should be concerned in the sense that, I mean, if you don't act now, uh, you know, doing, being a businessman, I mean, I don't think in 25 years' time, and then, and then I mean, other people, and uh, you were mentioning, I think government, they should think in the longer term. That's the reason why they have the capability of investing with an ROI that is, lo is lower in, 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 in the short term, as I in the long term. Mm -hmm. The businessmen, they look at me like medium and short term, and um, I'm not used to think again in 30 years' time. So. Uh, people need to understand that I mean, there's no future for business like ours where consumers are going to decide to buy into our brand or another brand in five years' time. Today, consumers, they're not yet ready to pay an extra price for that, but they want to be part of a company, of a narrative that is, is, is going into sustainability, this kind of uh, topics. So uh, if I want to build the, the, the business, uh, I need to start now, acting now. Right. Because, I mean, we, we, there are so many different scenarios going forward that even if we set a target in 2050, something could happen that is going to change dramatically, which, which are our expectations, especially in a situation where everything is growing so fast. Exponential growth of this kind of uh, impact can be, I mean, around the corner. So in order to avoid that, the only way uh, to do it is through the challenge, I mean, the way in which we do it, so of setting uh, carbon, um, uh, carbon emissions today in waiting in buying years for uh, technology. Because especially in our industry, we have tentative of companies that are uh, moving into this direction of, of disrupting completely our supply chain. I'm thinking about leather in vitro, for example. There are companies that are trying to create leather that is similar to the one that we are using for our bags, for example. Yeah. But they are not yet there in terms of quality. They are not there in terms of scalability. So we cannot move there now. We are investing in this company. We are collaborating with them. We, develop, we are doing research and development with them in order to do in that direction. But the point is we don't have time. So that's the reason why I'm going this situation today. I know that is not the right, the, the right solution, but more than offsetting is not offsetting. And the way in which you offset is important because if you do a social offsetting, trying to protect biodiversity as we were discussing, I think is the way forward. Right. I'm, today technology is not at the level for us to, to, to completely uh, um, block the carbon emission. But the way in which you, you participate to this challenge is quite straight. You need to be scope one, scope two, that is offices, shops, etc. but also scope three, that is supply chain. Supply chain impact for 90% of the carbon emission in our industry, and I think for most of the industries. Yeah. So if, you cannot say that you are net zero in talking just about your offices. It's a, it's a joke. So to do so then, you need to go scope three, you need to have a, um, a measurement to understand where you are, topic by topic, being available, transparent, someone, someone outside that is certifying what you're doing, having still the obligation to, have, to go into investing in technology because, again, right. the setting is not the solution. I, I want to, um, we have two more questions I really want to get to, but please be thinking of questions because I'm coming to the audience in just a minute. But to, to Sven, um, What's, what's the role for government? You, one of your large markets is the EU. Um, obviously, agricultural regulation is, uh, uh, or should, subsidies are a, a large factory, factor as well as um, emissions regulations. Can government be a catalyst for some of these uh, things we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely, I, I think so. Uh, but it's important that um, 
the governments uh, create an enabling environment and one that incentivizes uh, the farmers rather than putting additional burdens on the farmer. The, the everyday life of the farmer is uh, already extremely complicated, so uh, putting additional regulations on that will uh, just make it even more difficult. But to have a system that is fair and where we create traceability is, is important. And I brought a, a coffee cup here, but, and I wanted to refer to uh, uh, an article from the Financial Times back in, back in June. If you go to um, a, uh, a coffee shop in London and you get a cup of coffee, that's uh, two and a half pounds. And then they break that down, and how much of that two and a half pounds goes to the grower that actually uh, makes the coffee beans? It's one penny. One penny is going to the grower. And if you can create that uh, traceability, uh, maybe, uh, as, as you pointed out, Mark, may, maybe there's not, not a willingness to, to pay a premium, but at least direct the choices to food that is produced responsibly and use subsidies to help the farmers to, to get a premium for farming uh, sustainably, looking after soil health and using the right input to create the right quality. And here I think government can play an important role. And there's $700 billion of uh, subsidies going into the food systems every year. A lot of that is uh, misdirected. If you could have that more towards sustainability, I think that would, uh, would help. And, and also supporting and creating uh, open data platforms. Uh, we're doing some work on that uh, together with IBM to, to start to create that opportunity to, to give access to, to data, because I think that's, uh, that's key going forward to, to give the consumers this uh, access to how food is produced so that uh, we can make conscious uh, choices. Great. One more question, and I just, just to give us a sort of an overview, we have three uh, businesses that are making uh, progress on these issues. Can you give us a sense of the bigger picture? Um, you work with lots of different businesses, uh, but you know, to what extent, how much further do we need to go? How many more businesses and business leaders need to be uh, uh, pushed to do these things? And, and what's the overall picture? Then I promise I'm coming for questions. I think there's really exciting movement across lots of sectors. And um, Marco and I were talking this morning about luxury is really moving forward and looking for solutions, looking at how to create more equity amongst the producers on the ground, in the water for fishing as well. Sherry works with oceans. Um, I think that you know, we need to get to this conversation of who pays. You know, who's really paying for this? Because that's always the, the sticky part. And also redefining growth. Our, you know, we all t talk about shareholder value. Earth is our biggest shareholder. We need to make room for all these um, very efficient services it provides for us that we get for free. And um, Marco mentioned that supply chains, traceability, these things are really complicated for each particular business to solve. I mean, to, to rebuild agricultural systems takes a while. <laughs> to rebuild our luxury brands takes a while. Nature is a really quick solution, and you know, the more nature we have, the more it can help, help um, solve a lot of these issues for us as we come up with our human innovations. Great. Well, uh, I'd like to go to questions. So um, depending on how many we have, I might take multiple at once, but I only see two hands, so maybe we'll take, OK. We have a lot of them. I'll take, let's take three questions to start. Uh, we can go here and. Um, <clears throat> OK, yeah, we'll start here, and then we'll go to the two at the front. <laughs> it's not on. OK. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. And, and while you were speaking, I was thinking of uh, when they made the change to uh, post calories on things that you could order from Starbucks, my choices drastically changed. And then I was thinking about if that same type of posting was on an Amazon listing when I ordered something to be there in an hour, I might also make a different choice. And I just wondered if there was any effort so far that actually quantifies environmental impact on purchasing choices sort of from end to end from you know, the impact of the transportation to the house and then the packaging and the destruction of the packaging. And, and the, the sort of life of the product, and then you know, sort of end-to-end -end, uh, impact. Right, great, that's a great question. Um, and then, the, can we just do the two more, because I want to try to get to all the questions, but the two more at the front, there were two more at the, near the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to be a bit controversial here. What, um, 
at what I see is that the margin, that means the billions of lower middle class consumers in emerging markets like China, South Asia, Africa, um, they're not willing to pay a premium yet for anything that's sustainable because they're, they're on the margin themselves, right? So they're not willing to pay a premium. So businesses that are catering to them, and that's, that's the masses of businesses, right? That's the real stuff. It's not really, I mean, premium product is still, as, as you said, you know, right up there, small part, but people who are catering to billions and billions, um, those businesses are not going to change unless there's a, a, there's a business case or an incentive or something to actually move because, you know, they're at the margin as well, those businesses. So I'm just trying to see how to make, or an idea of how we make the, the masses change, right? That's, yeah. which is going to cause more change than perhaps some premium businesses, as it were. Right. Uh, that's a great question as well. There's one more behind you, and then we'll start building them. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, I was um, paying attention uh, to what was said about uh, natural capital and about uh, the need to uh, reflect the ecosystem services in our manufactured economy <laughs> and who is paying for that. And um, so my question would be, do you think it's going to be possible to bring more natural capital into mainstream economics and to include nature in the cost-benefit analysis um, that, of course, we all have to do in order to validate our business? Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so let's, let's start by talking, I think it was a, a transparency for the consumer that will allow them to make different choices, I think sums that question up. Um, who, anyone want to feel that in, in particular? I mean, yeah, you have. I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, we, are, we are trying to work on that, especially on the resale market. So we are, we, it's not yet that, uh, but I think we're gonna launch it in two months from now. The idea is uh, in order to, to get more circular in terms of economy, we are collaborating with a company called The Real Real, that are, they, 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 they resell something that is already there. And the point is, of course, it's a matter of certification, authenticity, so working with the brand is key. But the way in which we want to provide it is to try to show as soon as someone is gonna uh, resell a Gucci product, is gonna see directly on the website how much uh, savings going to have in terms of transportation, carbon emission, etc. instead of buying a new product. So, and especially for a brand like ours, where um, the idea of sustainability is embedded in our product because, I mean, normally they, they last for a long, long time because of the quality, the craftsmanship, and all the rest. The fact of being able to provide this kind of certification authenticity and making sure that the people are willing to buy vintage product and understanding the impact that you could have on the planet instead of buying a product directly from the company, I think is a good way to have an immediate uh, view of that. Oh, oh Kristen, I know you want to... I was going to say, um, these solutions obviously vary depending on developing versus developed country and who, where, who's, who sits with the bird and who pays is a huge question. And um, there are concerned citizens in the developed world who really want to know, what, what do I buy, what do I do? I, carbon tracking um, has unearthed a lot of great specifics of offsetting your plane ride, hopefully, which you did when you got here, and all those sorts of things. And I think for biodiversity, we need to get there. Um, what I'm excited about with new technology is big data and the ability to align all this information we now have from different industries to, for consumers to make those decisions. But there isn't like a one-stop shop yet to go into Starbucks and, and really weigh your choices. But I think it's coming. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I fully agree. And I, I think uh, technology we, in our development, in our eco-island development, we, think we, we track the number of species of birds and other. Uh, so it's sort of a biodiversity index. And I, I, I want to just say that uh, Peter from WBCSD, I think he had a good uh, new article about the triangle that will solve capitalism or that will change <laughs> capitalism. That uh, I think it talked about the three area. One is the science-based uh, data, and then uh, one is the ESG, and then the other is about the task force for the climate uh, financial disclosure, and I, I thought that that was very good. And and I think that um, in terms of uh, uh, my, my friend at Anushe Ansari at uh, X Prize just launched a prize for rainforest, so innovation to actually document and how to sell, uh, 
support the rainforest species. So there's, uh, we have used, uh, sort of collaborated with Peter Diamantis on sort of X Prize on coastal seawall and you know how do we do a seawall work, still work with uh, biodiversity solutions that so that there are really uh, inspiring solutions that came from all over the world and um, I think just on the uh, I think there is really challenges how how can you know uh, there is a platform that we are encouraging uh, blended finance uh, I think the Tri Takarana Forum on Blended Finance, which was held in Bali um, in, uh, with the World Bank, uh, around the World Bank MF annual meetings, uh, was the largest blended finance event. And I think we, through that, I think we wanted to work on um, solutions. One of the blended finance that was uh, in Indonesia was the TLFF, so it's for rubber plantations. And um, so, but there are many, uh, uh, needs uh, many. I just give a shout out. People may not realize uh, Indonesia is the world's largest uh, I island uh, archipelago country, 17,000 islands, and um, it also has the largest biodiversity, oceans biodiversity. And in terms of the peatland, uh, but I guess the peatland and rainforest, I think it's uh, you know added together in, in terms of the. Uh, I think. You know, maybe for biodiversity, I think uh, Amazon, Congo, Indonesia, but Indonesia, I think, is trying to move forward, and we are working with WAF, with World Bank, with uh, WRI, and many partners to find the solutions to what that. Thank you. Great. I think we've touched on the three of those questions sort of uh, uh, with different different ways, but I, I want to give Sven an opportunity to contribute anyway. Yeah, I, I, um, I wanted to address the, the question on uh, who's going to pay for this and uh, whether it's uh, through uh, premiums. I, I think if you have a holistic approach, there are uh, opportunities to finance this through looking at the, the, the totality. Take uh, health as an example, and let me use uh, uh, Finland uh, here, where they, they recognize that the, the selenium level uh, in the Finnish population was too low. Uh, how do they solve that? Uh, hand out supplements? Well, then they would only reach parts of the population. But what they ended up with was work with the farmers and get that through the soil, add selenium to the soil. It's picked up in the grass. Uh, then it goes through it in dairy or, or meat products. And they were able to, to raise the selenium level for the whole uh, population at uh, reducing the health cost and then helping the, the, the farmers. And the net positive of that is, uh, is tremendous. So, so it's finding opportunities like this, and there are many of them. But it requires the ability to, to think holistically and, and look at this as a solution where everyone contributes rather than just adding a premium. Right. Um, I think we have time for one question more. Um, so if there's somebody who has one very quick question. Um, OK. Um, thank you to the panel. I run a, a professional body in the UK, the Institute of Chartered Accountants. We launched that film that you saw at the start last summer, mm. and there were five things at the end that the film was recommending businesses had to do. I think you've covered all of them on the panel, apart from the fifth. And the fifth is to reimagine what success is for a business, because we're all, we're all held to account, whether it's by our boards or investors, or our consumers and regulators and governments, what, what do you think we should be doing to reimagine success? Um, that is a great question to end on, and maybe we could go down the line. We have a minute, so you just 15 second remarks. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it depends, I don't know, it's very much linked to the videos, but the way in which I see it, that the way in which we monitor and we give bonuses in the company is very much linked in, in most of the case to financial success and financial rewarding. Uh, okay. What we're trying to I'm gonna because I'm gonna we're gonna run out of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off, but it's that was the perfect remark. How, compensation, right? That was the yeah. that's the gist of it, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I I think. I'm sorry. Uh, it's success is uh, actually in the mind. I think we need to collaborate. That the theme of this this uh, event. I think uh, uh, WAF. I think the multi-stakeholder capitalism. Uh, but it's really, we need the spiritual aspect also. The spiritual, the harmony of the spiritual, harmony with the ecological, and harmony among people. Perfect. 
Um, success for me is uh, when we, we talk, talk about, uh, for, for, from our point of view, when we talk about agriculture as a um, net um, absorber of carbon rather than an emitter of carbon. Perfect. Capturing true costs for the costs and benefits of nature and accounting for growth differently in our, our global accounting system, which also solves a lot of our equity issues. So thank you so much to the panelists. I, I'll just add one final note, which is that this uh, topic is going to be ongoing throughout the week. There will be uh, several large announcements today and throughout the week, so please continue to follow. Thank you again.